So my name is Terry McGonigal. I'm, uh, uh, this is my 20th year of um, uh, doing uh, campus ministry work at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. I'm also um, uh, part of the, the Bible and theology faculty, so I teach two courses um, every, every year. Uh, Biblical theme of Shalom every fall, Gospel of John every spring. I've been living into this theme of Shalom for about 15 years in terms of my own pilgrimage. Uh, you by all the folks, if you've been to chapel either Wednesday morning or Wednesday night for after dark or yesterday morning, I, I've spoken a little bit about some of my life and journey along the way. Welcome, guys. Um, so I'm really glad to be with you for this conversation this afternoon and really glad to be back at SCORE again. This is my second time that Glenn's invited me to come sp speak at, at SCORE. Um, it was a great conference um, several years ago when I was here, and I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days that we have together. Just did a morning seminar and then blitzed out for a faculty presentation. Um, and Melanie Hulbert from George Fox University is presenting right now in terms of uh, what goes on in the dynamic of uh, you as students as you try and address issues of racism, ethnicity, diversity, intercultural competence. Um, and, uh, and how difficult that conversation can be among you as students um, on, on, uh, your, on your campuses. So, um, so I, uh, Glenn asked me to do something on intercultural competence. Um, my contribution to this conversation over a long period of time is really to um, help us understand that uh, these are not new issues um, that we're addressing in this conference. As a matter of fact, they are embedded in the story of the scriptures. But we don't often, we don't often see this in the scriptures because of a particular way in which American evangelicals have been acculturated to read the scriptures. Um, but all of what this conference is about is embedded in the story of God's people starting in Genesis and going all the way to the book of Revelation. And so what we're gonna do for the next uh, hour and, and some minutes is to simply look at one book, the book of Acts, as a case study of how the early church struggled to develop intercultural competence. And I underline that word struggle. This was not easy for them, that first generation of followers of Jesus, just like it's not easy with us. So I want to begin with a question, and uh, I'll put the question out there, and then I'll ask you to turn to each other in ones and twos, talk about, well, you, you know, no, you don't have a conversation with yourself. Turn in, in groups of twos and threes and have this conversation. Think back to a time when you felt the most home at church, when church really felt like I belong here. Now, by church, I'm not talking about a particular building, I'm not talking about a particular worship service, although those might be a part of your answer. I'm talking about when you really felt connected with other followers of Jesus. I identify what that is and see if you can give two or three elements of, of why you think you felt that way. Or maybe, maybe it's right now, maybe it's this conference. Uh, why did you feel so at home? What contributed to that? That, that sense of, I'm really with my folks, I'm with my tribe, okay? So take about five minutes to talk with each other about that, okay? The twos and, and threes, however you want to do it. Place and time and factors that led you to feel like, wow, that I really belong as part of God's people, okay? So talk about that with each other for a couple minutes. Okay. Um, we're not going to do a quiz. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to write it all down and turn it in. But it would be good for us to hear from each other. So just anybody who wants to, just you know, raise a hand. One or two factors either that, that you feel or expressed or that you heard in your conversation with some other, somebody else about what is a, are key elements that help us as God's people feel like we really belong and we're welcome in the community of God's people, the church. So some of the things you talked about. Yeah, G give me names, right? I'm Joy. Okay, go ahead, Joy. And uh, I talked about my RA group that I experienced. Okay. And something that I felt that connected us was having a common purpose and even kind of a common burden. Okay. To bear together. All right, so common purpose, mm -hmm. sense of 
of shared vision, but also you're carrying a mutual responsibility, something that you want to get after, something that you want to perhaps intervene and change along the way. Okay, good. What else? Yep. When Name? Both of us, I'm Chad. Okay, Chad, thank you. And we both kind of felt this way is when you're actively being proactive and serving. Ah, okay. Start growing. All right, okay. So a sense of I'm giving myself in relationship with others. Okay, good. What else? Yeah. We Name? Uh, Samantha. Okay, Samantha, go ahead. Um, we both kind of talked about worship, and we both experienced Syncspo and Biola, and we really kind of felt really connected to the people around us, too. Okay, so when you say worship, help me to say a little bit more. What, 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 what do you mean by that word? Um, I know, like, it can, worship can encompass your whole life. I think just okay. specifically for us, just the singing and that type. Music okay, all right. Expression. Okay, so music is a way in which you feel like you're drawn into the larger body of God's people. Yeah, the, the reason why I asked the question is worship can mean a lot of things, right? Okay, yeah, good. What else? Yep, go ahead. Um, for myself, Your name? Uh, love. Okay, love. Yeah, so I feel more connected based on the initial interaction when I get there. Ah. Um, like true, sincere, genuine, welcoming. Um, introduce me to other various members in the church when they see me. Okay. Like, oh, welcome. This is our new visitor, blah, blah, blah. And even like the pastor saying, all oh, our visitors stand up and you individually introduce yourself mm, to yeah, the congregation. Yeah, yeah. And they have active participation with, okay. with the lesson and yep. what you're learning. So that's okay. what I feel most welcome. So, so when you enter into a group of people, how it is that you're invited in, yes. the sense of, of, of belonging, mm -hmm. welcome, these people are glad that I'm here. That's a big part of that. Okay, good. What else? Anything else you want to share? Yep. Uh, Name? Joel. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Joel. Um, yep. I think maybe, as simple as it sounds, just eating together. Ah, like, okay. Because you're actually spending time, and then, I mean, most people are really happy when they're eating. Okay. So, like, All right. You know, so everyone's really friendly. And okay. And everyone's smiling. I okay, don't know. It's, all right. It's kind of a meat experience. Yeah, okay. So sharing meals together. Yeah. All right. Sitting at table together. You know, the, the, the joke of the church potluck, right? I mean, it's just like, I don't know that we're, we're going to go to another church potluck. Well, there, there's something going on there. And that's what you're, that's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, okay. Good. Okay. Um, anybody else? Okay, yeah, uh, name? I'm Liesl. Okay, Liesl, yeah. Um, and we talked about going through hard things and trials together and like mm. being, like sitting in brokenness together with people. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, going through hard things together and uh, being, yeah, thank you. Yeah. When, when the press of life is upon us, none of us is capable of carrying that load on our own. We need others to carry it for us. Good. Well, here's, uh, here's two of mine. First one was January 2009. I actually know the dates of both these. That's how significant they were. Um, I, led a, I led a class called The Prejudice Across America. And um, uh, we uh, were in four cities within three weeks. We began in um, uh, New York City, flew in on a Saturday night. Uh, staying in Upper Manhattan at the International Hostel and then just south of Columbia University. Got on the, the subway the next morning, rode up to Harlem, got out and walked over to Abyssinian Church. Abyssinian Baptist Church is a very important church that's generated uh, an incredible number of very prominent African American leaders in every form of our culture and society. The second Sunday, we were in Atlanta for the Dr. King uh, weekend celebration, celebration of Martin's uh, birth. And then on that Monday, uh, which you know, typically is a day off, I, I love what has happened in the last few years, a day on, not a day off, is what we talk about it as in, in Spokane. We got on a train and rode to DC. And we were actually in DC on Tuesday, the day of Obama's inauguration. Um, 
And then uh, a few days later, we went to Chicago, and the Sunday after Obama's inauguration, our last day in Chicago, we got up early, got on the red line, I grew up in Chicago, rode all the way down to the south end, as far as it goes, 96th Street, got off, and walked over a few blocks, and there we were at Trinity Church of God in Christ. That's the church where Barack Obama walked the aisle and gave his life to Jesus. And we had a very diverse spectrum of people in our, um, in this class of 19. Um, ethnically, gender, perspectives, politics. And the reason we went to Trinity was I wanted people to understand whatever you think about Obama's politics, you will not understand him as a person until you understand the church that led him to Christian faith. And so we went to Trinity. And there we were. And we walked in, and it was very obvious that we were the outsiders, right? The others. We didn't belong in the neighborhood, right? So about 20 minutes into this worship service, this huge choir is singing. I mean, the place is rocking. And in the middle of all this, uh, Dr. Calvin Butts Jr., the senior pastor, gets up and he says, Trinity, have you noticed we got a few visitors today? So he has us stand up. And he says, um, Trinity, I, I, think, I think we need to give our visitors a Trinity welcome. Let's welcome these folks. And the choir got back on its feet and they sang for 15 minutes. The welcome was 15 minutes long. In the middle of this worship service, people coming to us, who are you, what are you doing? Um, you're, on, you're on what kind of class? You're, you're studying what? And you were, oh my gosh, you were on the mall on Tuesday? Um, and, and you've been to Abyssinian? And, and you've been to Ebenezer? And wh what kind of class is this again? And what, wh what school are you from? And to a person when we debriefed over pizza that night, everybody said, we've never, ever received a welcome like that in any church we've ever gone to. And suddenly, politics became very secondary. Um, I, I remember that feeling well. And you remember those feelings that some of you have articulated, right? So if that's, if that's, the, if that's the best, the things that you've said, when you really feel like, wow, I'm a, I'm a part of this people, Take about two minutes now, real quick, one minute apiece. Talk about a time or a place when you felt not welcomed in the church. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's talk with each other for a minute. So, don't need to give any names or addresses of where, of where these incidents took place, but some of the factors that made you feel not very welcome, uncomfortable, or maybe it was pretty clear that people didn't want you there. What, what, what was going on that created some of that angst, some of that sense of unsettledness in you? Um, I think Name? Kim. Okay, go ahead, Kim. Um, the inability to ask questions and to oh. like have it share a different perspective, if that's um, not uh, welcomed and that's not um, allowed to, to come out, especially when you're in like a group. Like okay. sometimes they'll be like, oh, you can ask like the pastor like later, you know, or you can like talk about it one on one. But coming you know, coming up with different perspectives and asking questions, people think that leads to division. Okay. Um, and so they try to create one answer that everyone should embrace. All right. Um, and okay. That, yeah. Okay. So the lack of willingness to even lean into hard questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the lack of willingness to look at things from perhaps a different perspective. Okay, am I, am I understanding well? Okay, thank you. Joy? A sense of competition and jealousy, like by you being here, you might be competing for something that another church member is already like fulfilling. And, okay. And like, are you gonna change what we already have here because we like what we have here? Okay, all right. So some sense of power, threat, 
you coming in from the outside, we're not sure about what you what it means for you to be here in terms of our comfort level level of comfort. Okay. All right. Great. What else? Yeah. Um, Omar. Go ahead, Omar. Yeah. I was sharing that um, sometimes uh, uh, when it comes to the elders, when we're criticized because we're young and we don't think alike or we don't follow tradition as much, yeah. And the elders make us feel inadequate or we're not part of it. Okay. You know? so All right. So when the elders don't appreciate what you, at this stage of your life, bring to and could mean for the church, right. okay, and a sense of, did I hear a sense of demeaning? Sometimes. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So there's some age stuff going on there. We're, we're going to get into that right away. <laughs> that pops up, interestingly enough, in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Yeah. Sometimes I've seen in my church a little bit like theological division among the church. Like there's two different camps on different okay. um, opinions on like relationships or like Calvinism versus Arminianism. And okay. It, it makes it hard to feel welcome because you don't know which side to go to. All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, w when there are camps, theological camps within the same congregation. Yeah. And, and, and when those camps, let, let's just say, set up territory, theological territory, that's juxtaposed to others. Mm -hmm. You have to be one or the other, right? Which, so which camp are you on? Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the dangers of that is that somebody wants to take a theological label and put it right there. Mm -hmm. So you've got a flashing neon light, Pentecostal, charismatic, Bible believer, you know, whatever the label is, right? Okay, and the church has gotten really good at putting the, pasting those labels on us. Okay, that makes you uncomfortable. Okay, great. What else? Yep, name? Guthrie. Okay, Guthrie, yeah. Um, just like any church where there's um, not an environment for atmosphere of welcome. Okay. I feel like that's actually quite common, but um, especially in bigger churches where you, you know, you could go in, you're welcomed like really warmly at the door, but then that's it. Like, so you can be, if you're on your, in your, on your own in the service and then everyone's got their community, but no one welcomes yeah. you in. And so it's just like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. And then even some churches like, you can see that you're going there and it's almost like, like the movies, like there's no community after the service at all. Everyone just files out. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Okay. So it's not just the handshake at the door. Right. It's what happens when you actually move into that group of people right. and, and you're picking up the vibe yeah. and you're watching the dynamics among them, right? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yep. Um, I was going to actually add to that because we were just talking about right. that. Almost a sense of um, exclusion versus inclusion. Okay. So if you're new to the church and you don't have any set of a community or you're going to the church to find community and people may on a superficial or a, you know, a natural level of like community, but may not necessarily include you outside of right. connection beyond just that moment. Right. And so then you don't have a sense of community within the church or any contact for okay. a real opportunity for a relationship. Okay. So it becomes more, instead of being inclusive, it almost comes off as if it's exclusive. Exclusive. Mm -hmm. and, and, you've, and you feel in that situation very much like the outsider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. Was there another one? Yeah. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, yeah, same thing, uh, but maybe uh, just the lack of a genuine greeting. Okay. Uh, instead of it was just some, you know something where it's like God bless you, brother, and right. it actually used to uh, bother me when people would tell me that, and because I didn't really feel blessed at all, you know, yeah. <laughs> they would just say hi and yeah, and then there I am sitting in the back and and no one even knows my name. Yeah. And I, I mean, being a mature believer, yeah, one should go introduce himself and stuff, but uh, it was a little um, disappointing to say the least. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. We're talking about what, what things have either helped you feel welcome in a, in a community of God's people or alienated and cut off. So that, your name is? Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Welcome. Glad to have you here. So here's, this is a combination of when I felt really welcome combined with when I felt really alienated. So in January of 1991, 
I led a group of uh, students to Nicaragua, and this was just two weeks before the election uh, that actually was won by Violeta Chamora. She uh, defeated Daniel Ortega in, in the election. The United States was providing enormous resources to support what, what was the UNO coalition. 16 political parties in Nicaragua all lined up against Daniel, okay? from the far right political party all the way to the Communist Party. And you talk about political diversity, there's a lot more of it in Nicaragua in 1991 than there was here in the United States. We spent some time in uh, a community up in the mountains, Matagalpa, where a good friend of mine, Jim Hornsby, was starting the Habitat for Humanity work there. And the last night that we were there, we worshiped in this little Pentecostal church and um, the, the pastor there was a man named Amancio Sanchez. Now I had read about Amancio because a few years earlier on a Sunday, he announced to his congregation that um, the following Sunday, he was gonna take all the, all the kids up into the, the, the campo for a picnic in the afternoon and then moms and dads could hang out and just get a little break. And so he'd organize a couple pickup trucks to be there and uh, some volunteers were gonna take the kids up to the pickup or up, up to the compo. So they get in their pickup trucks after, after church. His uh, daughter's sitting in the, in the front seat along with his niece and he's right here and he backs up his pickup truck and he runs over a mine that was planted underneath the truck during the worship service. That mine was planted there by the Contras the group of people that uh, our presidents Reagan and Bush, first Bush, senior Bush, had said were the equivalent of the founding fathers of the United States. What had Amancio done to deserve that? He had tried to be a peacemaker in visiting the camps of both the Sandinistas and the Contra. That's all he'd done. Six kids were killed. Daughter lost both legs, niece was maimed, he lost a leg. And now years later, I'm sitting in a worship service with this man as the pastor. And we're going back to the United States the next day. At the end of that worship service, Amancio calls us forward. He had all of us as a group kneel in front of him and he called the congregation around us and he, they laid hands on us and this was their prayer. Gracious God, help our dear brothers and sisters, we are all followers in Jesus, to go back to their country and tell Christians in that nation that Christians in Nicaragua want peace with Christians in the United States. I have never felt so welcomed in a place where it would have been so easy to have been shunned because we were from the country that did that to the precious children of his church. Incredible that we would ex experience that kind of grace. So the next day we fly home. I get to Colorado Springs late at night. There's a blizzard. Um, I'm in my shorts and flip flops. The cab from the, my wife was gonna come to pick me up but it was snowing so much she couldn't get out of our driveway. The cab couldn't get within a mile of our house, so literally the last mile, I've got my backpack on, I'm wearing my flip-flops and shorts, I'm tramping through the snow, thinking, Lord Jesus, make this walk go away, and part the snows like you did the Red Sea, and let me get home as quick as possible. So Sunday morning, we go to church, the church that I helped start in 1984. I love these people, I love Covenant Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I didn't know, but one of the members of our congregation was the daughter of a U.S. Senator. And the Senator happened to be there that morning. So somebody told the Senator after the worship service that I had just come back from Nicaragua. So I'd love to talk with him. So somebody comes over, grabs me by the sleeve, walks me over, we introduce ourselves. And the Senator says, I'm curious about your opinion of Nicar Nicaragua. What's going on down there? Now he'd been an outspoken, supporter of the Contra. And he was a supporter of the coalition that, 
that supported Violetta against Danielle. I was going to be in D.C. a couple weeks later, and so I, and I'd already arranged to have an appointment with the senator. So I said, well, Senator, I'm, I'm going to be in D.C. in a couple weeks and we can talk about my opinion. But let me tell you a story of what just happened to me less than 72 hours ago in Nicaragua. And I told him about meeting Amancio, and I told him about them laying hands on us. And then I said, Senator, if Amancio was here, he'd say it himself, but he's asked me to say it on his behalf. Christians in Nicaragua want peace with Christians in the United States. His chief of staff was there with him. And the moment I said that, the chief of staff stepped between the senator and me. He pointed his finger at me and he said, how dare you say that to the senator? And he started screaming in the sanctuary after worship, you are a communist, you are a communist, you are a communist, you are a communist. It kept escalating and getting louder and louder and louder until everybody in the auditorium just shut up and was looking right at me. And they didn't know what had happened. People in my church came up afterwards and said, how could you offend the senator like that? And I said, you have no idea what I just said. Some of those people for years were angry with me. That's when I felt really, really, really like I was outside my element and these are not my people. Even though I had helped start this church, even though when the senior pastor was away, I'd preach to these people countless times. Over politics, somehow, suddenly, I was the outsider. So why we've gone through this long exercise for the first half hour of our time together is to help us understand what it is that draws us into the community of God's people and what it is that alienates us from God's people. Now, take all that stuff about what we just expressed and think about somebody who might be interested in Jesus and just enters into your community wherever you worship, but has no previous background. They don't know Bible. They don't know evangelical terminology. They don't know Calvinism, Arminianism. They know none of that. So how is a person walking into that environment going to either be nurtured into relationships or driven from it. And what I want to say to you is, for the church to become the church that God wants it to be, I believe that we've got to develop intercultural competency. Because every one of the factors that you've identified on both sides of the ledger in the last half hour have to do with intercultural competence. How is it that we navigate interculturally to create connections between us as people. That those are the skills that we're talking about that need to be developed for the church to be the church. Well, it's no surprise that since the beginning of the church, the first generation of people after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, this has been on the forefront and the book of Acts is filled with it. So what I want to do on the basis of what we just described about our own background and experience, start to see if there's clues in the book of Acts of how to navigate intercultural difference in order to become interculturally competent. Okay? For the sake now, please hear this, for the sake of being God's people and for the sake of the witness of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is not about some other agenda other than being God's people and being faithful as God's people. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so intercultural competence or incompetence in the book of Acts. We're going to see some of it, some of both. So it's very clear what Jesus is up to when we listen to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. All authorities in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. The Greek word is mathetes, to make lifelong learners and followers of all nations. Oh, how I wish the NIV translation would not use the term nations. 
Because when we think of nations, we think about borders, arbitrary lines that we draw in particular places. That's a construction of the world that comes out of modernism, that comes out of Western perceptions of a worldview in the last few centuries. The actual term is ethne, from which we get our term ethnicity. Go and create people from every ethnicity on the face of the earth to be followers of me. So Kwame Beriako, this incredibly wise and insightful African theologian quoting, quoted by Bryant Myers in his book, Walking with the Poor. The Great Commission, therefore, is about the discipleship of the nations or the ethnicities, the conversion of the things that make people into ethnicities, societies, cultures, the shared and common processes of thinking, attitudes, worldviews, perspectives, languages, cultural, social, economic habits of thought, behavior, and practice. These things in the lives of the people in whom such things find expression, all of this is meant to be within the call of discipleship. Okay? It's important to have our quiet times. It's important to pray. But that is not the sum total of discipleship. Discipleship is about all of the factors that make us as people into societies. And the church is a society. So it has to do with politics and power. It has to do with economics and environment. It has to do with everything. And that's what Beriaco is urging. So we're, we are up against uh, some challenges when we start to engage this. And the challenges have been given to us by Platonic dualism, which is the winner in terms of the creation of the Western world. Platonic dualism says there's division between the material and spiritual, belief and action, soul and body, individual spiritual evangelism versus communal social action. Leslie Newbigin, the incredible Anglican missiologist who went and lived his entire adult life in India as a witness to the gospel, writes in foolishness to the Greeks, the deed without the word is dumb and the word without the deed is empty. So when we draw these distinctions that are not biblical, they are cultural from a worldview that I, I would say is antithetical to the biblical worldview, those distinctions keep us from living out a legitimate and holistic gospel. So, and you can, Jim Wallace, uh, the, the great leader of the Sojourners community in Washington, D.C. Jim talks about holistic shalom being both personal and corporate in character. So I would commend to you a passage, Isaiah 52, 7, which is the foundation for our understanding of the good news. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news. And then the question is, what is the good news, right? Isaiah is not going to leave it to his audience to fill in the blanks. He's going to tell us. The good news has three parts to it. I'm going to go in reverse order. The declaration of God's reign, Yahweh Malach, the kind of reign that comes that we see in Genesis 1 and 2 when God speaks and the world is created according to shalom order. That's what it means for God to reign. When Jesus comes over a hundred times in the four Gospels, he says, I've come to do what? Bring the kingdom of God to reestablish God's reign. That's Isaiah 57 to 52, 7 Gospel. When God starts to re when God starts to reign in a broken world, God sets the world right, and we get Yeshua, salvation, which by the name, by the way, is Jesus' actual name, God's salvation, God saves. So the question then becomes, what does salvation mean? The answer to that question all depends on the worldview paradigm that you understand through which you read the scriptures. So for a holistic understanding of salvation, I would commend to you Howard Snyder's book, Salvation Means Creation Healed. Shua in Hebrew, to save, sozo in Greek, 
to save, that's the way it usually gets translated, literally means to restore and to make whole, to set things right that are broken. And when God reigns, and when God's reign reestablishes the order that God intends in creation, the outcome, the result of that, is shalom, and that's what this whole conference is about. So Scott McKnight, in his King Jesus Gospel, asks this probing questions. Are we evangelicals, in the sense of Isaiah's ev evangelical, or are we salvationists? And what he means by that is, if we simply emphasize one of the three components of Isaiah's gospel, we are not evangelicals. What we're really after is salvation as we define it informed by Platonic Western dualism. I would commend to you his book, The King Jesus Gospel. McKnight was at North Park um, in Chicago and now has moved to Northern Seminary. It's a great read. And the whole book is about his analysis of what the early church is doing in the way that they proclaim and live the gospel in, in the book of Acts. So, Pedrito Maynard Reed, this uh, Haitian theologian, writes this. The aim of evangelism is the establishment of shalom, wholeness. Where does he get that? From Isaiah. This shalom is announced in the Kerygma proclamation it is lived in koinonia, fellowship, and sharing with each other. It is demonstrated in diakonia, humble service to others. These three, kerygma, koinonia, diakonia, should all be integrated into evangelism's shalom. So you talked about the importance of service, right? Can people see our living out of good news in the way that we serve in our communities for the common good, with no other agenda than just being committed to the goodness of where the places where we live. That's diakonia. That's one of the three key elements that we're gonna see in the book of Acts in the first six chapters. So just like you can't have a gospel with all, out all three components of Isaiah, we can't have a legitimate and authentic church without kerygma proclamation, koinonia community, and diakonia service. The church cannot pick and choose which of those we think is most important because the early church did all three. So here's what we have. In Acts chapter one to six, we have kerygma, the proclamation of good news in Acts chapter two which immediately leads into koinonia, community life in chapter two and chapter four. And then in diakonia, uh, we have in chapter six as deacons are appointed for the purpose of the service of the church. So let's just break this down for a moment, okay? So here's the day of Pentecost. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every ethnicity under heaven. Every ethnicity under heaven. Now, now the reality is, what we know, is that list of all of the different people groups that are mentioned here are the identifiable people groups that lived within the extent of the Roman Empire. Now, Rome was arrogant enough to say, if you've been to Rome, you've been to the ends of the earth, which meant we are the center, right? So, you know, and, and cities, we, we, we compete around the world for what's the greatest city, right? So Sochi's been on, on the screen for the last two weeks. I wonder what's gonna happen to Sochi three months after the Olympics. If history tells us anything from previous Olympic sites, the great spectacle of those buildings may turn into nothing but rotted remnants within decades. That's what's happened in a lot of places. Rome has this attitude, we're the center of everything. So all the peoples that Rome is, has under its control, they are represented by people there on Pentecost Sunday. 
the world is there. And when the proclamation takes place, the known world receives good news. In the miracle of translation by the power of the Holy Spirit, everyone is hearing the good news in their own language. And those of you who study anthropology, sociology, intercultural studies, you know the, that language is the primary, one of the primary foundations of every culture. How committed is God to reach out to all people? God will create a miracle of proclamation where everyone is going to hear in a way that is culturally attuned to how they would understand the good news. That's how the church started. So if, if we, be, if we haven't even listened to Peter's proclamation yet, we're just hearing the miracle of what God's doing. If this is what God does on the birthday of the church, then we need, we need to really wake up and pay attention to that. So how is it that we become interculturally competent in order to carry out kerygma, koinonia, diakonia in ways that will touch people's lives because they will understand it through their own cultural lens. That's what God's up to on Pentecost. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God, every one of us in our own languages. And there was no argument about which translation was better because the Spirit of God's doing great translation in every tongue. Oh, how, how I wish we would stop fighting about translations. So here's the, here's the kerygma. <clears throat> the accusation, of course, is you guys have gotten wasted early in the morning, been drinking some cheap wine, right? I mean, that, 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 that's the word on the street when, when the skeptics see what's happened. No, 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 no. This, this, you want to know what this is? This is the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said would happen when God's spirit starts to reinvade our broken creation. This is the last days, says the Lord. I will pour out my spirit, look at this, upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. On my men servants and maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now you just gave witness to in your congregation, age discrimination, right? You know what? God doesn't give a rip about age. On old and young, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Different functions, right? The young ones, you have visions and you have energy and passion to accomplish and fulfill those visions. So those of you at Vanguard, some of you know the names Cresselius and Hartnoff. Those are the guys that were in my kids' youth program at Whitworth Presbyterian Church in Spokane who went to Vanguard who have now started Crochet Kids. How many of you know about Crochet Kids? All right. I, you know, I know Cole. I know those guys. My kids have skied with them. And I'm thrilled that the Spirit has come upon them with a passion and a vision to create a, a, a sustainable business that's blessing people all over the world. But I'm an old one. I'm 62 years old. I've got four grandkids, two more to be born in April and May. My time's running out. But I'll tell you what, I still have dreams for those kids. And I want to give you I want to say something. I want to ask your forgiveness. Because 40 years ago, my generation sat where you're sitting now, filled with passion, filled with enthusiasm, filled with hope. And I look back over the last 40 years and what my generation has done to our world and to the church, we've made a mess of everything. and our time's running out, and we're not going to have enough time to clean it up before the whole mess gets dumped into your lap. 
but I'm asking you, please do better than what my generation has done for the sake of my grandkids and your cousins and someday your grandchildren. That's, that's the big vision that God's got here at Pentecost. Young and old all receive God's spirit. Notice, notice there's no gender distinction. The spirit is poured out equally upon men and women. So we divide on the, age, on the basis of age. We divide on the basis of, of gender. Oh no, you can't have that role or you can't do that or whatever we do because of your gender. I don't think God really cares. If I listen, listen to this text real carefully. I don't think God cares much about class distinctions because you get men servants and maid servants. The reality is the first generation of the early church, the vast, vast majority of all the people that came to Christ were from the lowest of the lowest of, the cla of all classes. And that becomes a huge issue in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Because there are some members of the Corinthian church that got a lot of bucks. And they refused to be unified in that church over class distinctions. The Spirit of God being poured out, Joel, Joel says, I, I, God doesn't worry about that. Not about ethnicity, not about age, not about class, not about gender. What we've done is we've created those categories and we've used them as ways to leverage distinction between each other. And that's why we have to learn intercultural competence in order to get back in tune with God's vision for what God wants to do in the world. And it comes right here from Pentecost at chapter two of the book of Acts. And it shall be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. One more distinction was raised over here, theological distinctions. The Arminians are cheering for that final verse of 21, right? That's all about human free will, okay? You know what the last verse of Peter's sermon ends with? And all of you will be saved, whomever the Lord our God calls unto himself. Whoa, I come from the Reformed tradition. We love that, that line. But what do you do with this? At Pentecost, you've got both the Arminian position and the Calvinist position, front end, back end of Peter's speech is, is does Peter have theological schizophrenia here? Is he bipolar? Or are those theological labels that we put on each other irrelevant at the moment God forms the church? Part of what we have to do to be on the right trail, we gotta start in the right place. We, we need to go back to the beginning and ask how did this whole thing start? Here's how the church starts. And all of those categories that you identified that make you uncomfortable with church, these categories are all being addressed. In one prophecy, as Peter is explaining to the people there, this is what God intends, and Peter's not making this up. This came from the prophet Joel long before Jesus. All Jesus did was live into that vision of what God always intended for all people. And the kerygma now is focused upon Jesus. This is the great work of Scott McKnight in his King Jesus Gospel. We think evangelism is about preaching to get somebody to do something. You go back and you read all of the evangelistic speeches in the book of Acts, and they are first and foremost about Jesus. Oh yeah, there, there, there's some stuff about response but the emphasis is on the person and the work of Jesus. And there's a lot of space for people to respond in different ways. There's the kerygma, and it calls for a response. Verse 39, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The great divides that we've created theologically and fought over are addressed in the speech at Pentecost if we just took the time 
to listen and had our ears open to receive what's being said here. So you've got now all of these people from all these different ethnic backgrounds who have all responded to the proclamation of good news in Jesus prompted by God's Spirit on Pentecost. 3,000 people in one day. Wow. Now, how are they going to live with each other? So here's the answer, koinonia. Verse 44. They were together. They held everything in common. There was economic sharing. Verse 46. There was time to gather for common worship. Some of you mentioned that. There was time to gather around tables and share meals. And they were enjoying favor with all the people. That's not just those in the community. The word's getting out in Jerusalem. Something new's going down here. And the ripple effect just sweeps over that city over time. As the Lord was adding daily to the number who were being saved. Pedrito Maynard Reed. This church was countercultural in its community life, sharing together, breaking down racial and cultural barriers which existed in Roman society. Such a life demonstrated the good news of the reign of God. Why was this community so attractive? Because what we talked about at the beginning of our time here this, today, our hearts, all of our hearts, are longing to be a part of a community. Just like the people in Jerusalem were longing to be a part of a community. And this community was welcoming of people. And when they experienced the quality of life in Koinonia, they said to each other, I'm finally home. I have found my people. And the church exploded. You want to talk about a church growth strategy? Here it is. Be faithful to the vision of Joel prompted by God's spirit, and this is what God will do. Diakonia. But then there's trouble. He knew sooner or later, one of the cultural categories to trip us, gender, race, or class, was going to get in and met, meddle with things. And here it is, finally, sixth chapter. In those days when the numbers of disciples were increasing or literally exploding, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay. Listen to the Old Testament over and over and over again, and there are three groups of people that are constantly identified as those that Israel as a community has to keep their eye on. The orphan, the alien, the gedim in Hebrew, the outsider, and the widows. And the reason those three are mentioned, I talked about this this morning, is that that's where the least power resides in the community. Those three groups of people do not have power. So the test of how the community is doing in terms of its quality of life is always measured on the fringes. So, so you, you know that when Maasai herdsmen in rural Kenya are passing each other on the roads and the trails between one village and the other, here's what they ask. How are the children doing? The least powerful in the Maasai communities. And on the basis of the answer, everyone will know how the entire community is doing. I've often thought, if someone to, were to ask us in the United States, how are the children doing, what would we answer? And what would that say about us as a people? How are the widows doing? See, that's the question here. How are the widows doing? Some not so well on the basis of ethnic distinctions.
the Hebrew Jewish widows get more food than those who are Jews in terms of their worship life, but have some, quote, tainted ethnicity by virtue of not having both mother and fathers who were both, Jew, who were both Judaic Jews, Hebrew Jews, from the true line of Israel, according to this mythology in Judea. So some brave people raise their hands and they say, wait a minute, before we have the prayer of blessing and start the church potluck, there's something wrong here. That's a dangerous move because then the community has to face the question that Joy raised. Do we have to change? Wait a minute, we're comfortable. This is the way we've always done it. Are you saying there's something wrong with our community? And the people with their hands in the air are saying, yeah. When I go back and read scripture, when I go back and, and, and read in Deuteronomy 10 that Moses speaks to Israel after the Exodus and says, there shall be one way of life for all people in this community, both for you who are citizens and for the Gedim, the outsiders, on the basis of the Bible, somebody's raising their hand high and saying, on the basis of scripture, what's happening here is wrong. Then the community has to de decide what they're gonna do with that prophetic, true biblical word. In this case, the community listens. And they say, you're right, this can't go on. This is going to harm our witness to the gospel. Now, what happens next is the creation of a multicultural power structure in the early church. The names of the seven that are chosen are all Gentile names. In other words, these were, they, these, were, these were monotheistic Jews, not ethnically, but religiously, but they came from Gentile settings. They didn't come from Judea. They didn't come from the beltway of Jerusalem. We had multicultural leadership, multi-ethnic leadership, right at the beginning of the church because some brave people were, were, this is not in accord. This is not all that God had, this is not shalom. Now, of course, what gets left out here, what's strange about this story is, this is all about women, it's about the widows, right? But it's seven men that get appointed. So there's a step being taken. We're gonna get, we're gonna get to the gender issue in, in a moment. This to me is an illustration of what Nick Walterstorff calls proximate shalom. We don't, we don't just go from unshalom to shalom. We're always taking steps towards what God wants. And the reality is we're going to be taking steps for the rest of our life. This is a good step. It's a right step. It doesn't go all the way, according to my opinion. But my opinion doesn't count according to what we find in the scriptures themselves. So, there it is. Kerygma, koinonia, diakonia, dealing with multicultural issues. An Athenian philosopher writing now in 125 AD, <laughs> describing Christians. In their imagination, they conceive that it is God they serve. When they see a stranger, they take him to their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. They don't call them brethren after the flesh, but brethren, brothers and sisters after the spirit and in God. If there is any among them that is poor and needy, if they have no spare food, they fast for two or three days in order to supply to the needs, needy their lack of food. They observe the precepts of their Messiah with much care, living justly and soberly as the Lord commanded them. And verily, there is, this is a new people. We've not seen anything like this on the face of the earth before. There is something divine. In other words, there's something about the work of God in the midst of them. That is a skeptical, atheist 
dualist philosopher describing the Christian community. That's not spin from inside the community. A Roman historian wrote to an emperor a little bit later, and he said, we have the most powerful army on the face of the earth, and I uh, regret to tell you, beloved emperor, that our army is absolutely impotent to stop the spread of the Christian faith because our army can do nothing to stop the power of love. So there's something going on about the nature of this community and what the Spirit of God is doing in them. So I want to fast forward now and talk a little bit about other barriers that the early church had to deal with in their life and ministry in the rest of the book of Acts and then pull in a little bit of a couple of Paul's letters. So barriers to the gospel. Now, one of the barriers is how acculturated these people were before they ever entered into the Christian community. On the screen is a first century Jewish prayer. I thank you, God, that I was not created a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Notice how the categories of ethnicity, class, and gender frame that prayer, which means if this, if this prayer is taken seriously and it is true, it means there's only one group of people that are really God-blessed, and that's Jewish men. And that leaves a whole lot of other people out. But that's the spin. So when Paul writes in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, what Paul's doing in this principle the, uh, that we are all one in Christ Jesus, he's undoing that, that, that Jewish prayer, that male prayer, isn't he? Where to get those categories? He say, no, here's how I'm praying. I'm, I'm gonna pray an anti-prayer against the prayer that Paul had drummed into him as one of the elite in Jewish society. Paul writes about that in a couple of his letters. You wanna talk about privilege? <laughs> I'll tell you about privilege. I had privilege on top of privilege on top of privilege. Birthright, tribe, education, language, zeal for the law, Pharisee. I know all about privilege. All that privilege that comes from that prayer at the top. Paul says it's rubbish. Just throw it in the trash and leave it there but race, gender, and class. So we've got the race issue, the ethnicity issue, working in Acts 6. In Acts chapter 8 then, one of the seven who's appointed to be a deacon, an elder, a deacon in the early church, Philip, with a Gentile name, gets used by God first to proclaim the good news to Samaria and then to an Ethiopian eunuch. Where's the 11, now 12, of Jesus' original disciples? They're stuck in their acculturation. It takes somebody from outside the dominant culture to say, I'm welcome, which means Samaritans can be welcome, which means Ethiopian eunuchs can be welcome. And so you've got an, an, an outbreak that goes beyond the categories that we saw in Acts 2. This undoes what I talked about in chapel on Wednesday here at Biola, the prayer of James and John, Lord, shall we call down fire upon the Samaritans? That prayer is laced with theological privilege and power and prejudice. And Jesus, the text says, rebuked them. And the word for rebuke is the word that is always used when Jesus encounters a demon. In other words, any attitude that claims theological privilege, power, and prejudice that excludes another group of people, not just excludes, James and John want them nuked, incinerated by the power of God. Jesus says that's demonic. So how's he gonna undo it? He gives them a strategy. You're gonna go by, through Samaria two by two. I'm gonna give you a script. 
You don't speak fire, you speak shalom. He tells him twice. And then you share meals. Twice he says in this little short passage in Luke 10, whatever they put on the table in front of you, sit down and eat it and have a conversation with your hosts. Don't ask about how they cooked it or where it came from or what kind of pots that were used in the process of preparing the food. Just receive their hospitality. This sense of exclusion is embedded in the disciples and Jesus slowly is purging it out of them. One sign of this is Samaria, chapter eight of the book of Acts. These people receive the gospel and when they do, the Jerusalem disciples, they wanna check this out. Boy, are you, playing, are you playing by our theological categories? And who do they send up to Samaria? Peter and John. John, who wanted to call down fire in, Acts, in Luke, Luke 9, is now back in Samaria. And these people who he, he wanted to kill earlier in the story now have received Jesus. Good news. Now, John's got an enormous crisis. Is it possible that the Spirit of God, we will be working in the Samaritans, just like happened on the day of Pentecost? And John's experience changes his theology. I want you to, John's experience changes his theology. He was sure he was theologically right in Luke 9. And he couldn't have been more wrong. He has to go sit down and share meals with Samaritans and discover they love Jesus just as much as he does. And then he's got to go back and confess to the Jerusalem church, you know what, what, I was wrong all along. John's got to eat some humble pie, but he's willing to do it for the sake of the unity of the church. And then Peter's got to go through the same thing in Acts chapter 10, right, with Cornelius, the Roman centurion. No, Lord, I, I'm not, I've never eaten anything unclean. Well, Peter, you, you did for a long time while you were going through Samaria back there in, 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 in the Gospel of Luke, but, you know, we all have selective memory, right? Don't call anything impure which God has created, including Roman centurions. Wow, I mean, we're, we're just breaking out. The Council of Jerusalem has to decide now, are we going to be monocultural, monoethnic, monoclass, or are we going to be multi, multi, multi? Are we going to be interculturally competent? The decision of the book of Acts is this, and I so appreciate this. There's only one thing that makes a person a member of the Christian community. That's their commitment to Jesus. But we do have cultural sensitivities. And when we encounter another brother's or sister's cultural sensitivities for the sake of our relationship with each other and for the sake of the witness of the gospel, we submit our freedom to not offend that other person's cultural sensibilities. This is not a prerequisite of salvation. It is just good interpersonal relations. And so whenever I travel, particularly in Central America, I'm always aware with the students that I'm traveling with how much we need to accommodate our sense of culture to the dominant culture that we're living in and receive the hospitality of the hosts that are having us for homestays. That's just good interpersonal relationships. That's what the book of Acts is urging in chapter 17. So, uh, case study now, real quickly. So. Uh, Ephesus, uh, Acts chapter 19, Paul's there for a couple of years. He is um, serving the community. He's committed to the common good. He actually starts a business. Anybody wants to ask about microenterprise development? Well, Paul sure would believe in it. That's what he did. He was a tent maker, and he did business with, with whoever came to him. There wasn't any show me your religious card. I'll do business with anybody because I want to be in relationship with everybody. Well, over time, the gospel starts to spread in Ephesus. And Ephesus and Corinth are two great case studies of how intercultural competence and gender relationships intersect with each other. 
because both in Ephesus and in Corinth, there are temples to pagan goddesses in which cultic prostitution is a normal part of worship. We call them cultic prostitutes. They were basically sex slaves justified under the banner of religious practice. That's what these women were. And over time, Paul's presence and the spread of the good news of Jesus, which is creating this countercultural community, starts to challenge the dominant paradigms of Ephesus, which means it starts to challenge the economy that is built upon idolatry linked to sexual cultic prostitution of women. So the power brokers, those who have all the money, rise up and they start to accuse Paul of being an enemy of the state of Ephesus, of the city of Ephesus. A riot almost breaks out. Some of Paul's fellow Christian companions are beaten. Paul, if he went, goes into the arena, if you've been to Ephesus, you can go there. If you ever travel to Turkey, go there and imagine 25,000 people screaming how great Artemis is. And the lives of these sisters and brothers in Christ are on the line. And Paul's escorted out of town, but he, he leaves with a bad taste in his mouth. It didn't end well. And my sisters and brothers are in jeopardy. And then he writes back. Time always buys perspective for us, doesn't it? He writes back, and this is what he writes in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul uses the word shalom quite often. He uses it four times in this brief passage in Ephesians 2. For Christ himself is our erene, our peace, the Greek word that's equivalent to shalom, who has made the two one, that would be the ethnic divide, destroying the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. <coughs> By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. This is the NIV translation out of the two. Thus making RNA, and in this one new body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which God put to death their hostility. He came, preached, he came and preached shalom, RNA, to those of you who are far away, that'd be the Gentiles, and RNA to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. You are no longer gerim, but you are fellow citizens. That's what Deuteronomy 10 says with God's people and members of God's own household. In other words, you are in God's family. And all of our divisions are being made to be built together in a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. That's the description of the Christian community. In both Paul's letters to the Ephesians and the Corinthians, he writes specifically about the role of women in the church because it's in those two places where cultic prostitution's been, been being practiced that Paul says there's another rule of life here. And this is how we live. And what Paul is doing is he's recognizing what the Spirit of God said through Joel, proclaimed by Peter back at, at Pentecost, that the Spirit of God comes upon all flesh. And the church needs all people, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or class, to be playing their proper God-ordained role for this community to be God's people. So when we start imposing stuff on each other on the basis of theological categories or age or ethnicity or class or gender, we are diminishing the church that God intends to create. And the only way for us to become God's people, again, in the full sense of what I think God intends, is for us to learn spirit-led multicultural competence. This conference is not a sidebar to what the church is about. The church has to develop what SCORE is about in order to be the church for the sake of witness. We hope you enjoyed this message. 
Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.